You're listening to Workplace Perspective, an employment law podcast raising the bar at workplaces everywhere. Workplace Perspective is a regular podcast series for employers and employees focusing on education, training, and the law to help organizations of all sizes develop and maintain successful workplace relationships. The opinions expressed by guests on Workplace Perspective are their own and should not be considered legal advice. And now, here's your host, Teresa McQueen. Thank you, James, and welcome everyone to Workplace Perspective, where we are striving to raise the bar at workplaces everywhere. One of the hottest topics in employment law today is vaccine mandates. Are they lawful? Are there any exceptions? As an employee, what should I know? As an employer, what can I do? So many questions. Lucky for us, we've got a great source for answers. On today's episode, we're talking with attorney Sharon Rennert. Sharon works as a senior attorney advisor at the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC. She is part of the ADA GINA division in the EEOC's Office of Legal Counsel, and she's here today to answer some important questions about vaccine mandates in the workplace. It's going to be a great show. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Workplace Perspective has a new website. Visit us at www.workplaceperspective.com. Check out our new look, including our featured guests and archive sections. Share us with your friends and colleagues to help us continue to raise the bar at workplaces everywhere. Welcome back to our listeners and welcome to Workplace Perspective, Sharon Rennert. Thank you. We are so excited to have you. I cannot tell you. I've been waiting so long to talk about this topic with someone from the EEOC. I'm just so excited. So, but before we get into it, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about you, who you are and what you do? Thank you. Well, as you mentioned, I work for the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission's Office on ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and GINA, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. And I think what is perhaps most important for your listeners, two things. One, uh, I have spent my career Uh, working on the ADA and particularly helping employers and employees understand in the workplace how this law works. And that really fits with the assignment I got back in February of 2020 to start working on the COVID-19 pandemic and have been doing so ever since. So uh, putting that all together, hopefully able to explain how today's topic, vaccines, uh, work in terms of the federal equal employment opportunity laws. We're doing a question and answer format today, but a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. So the idea of vaccination mandates really raises questions under a number of state and federal laws. So here in California, vaccine uh, issues in the workplace raise questions under our Fair Employment and Housing Act, the FEHA, which prohibits Uh, harassment, discrimination, retaliation based on protected classifications such as disability, race, and religion. The Fair Employment Housing Act in California is enforced by by our state's uh, Department of Fair Employment and Housing. Now, at the federal level, employees are protected against discrimination, harassment, and retaliation under several equal employment laws, which include, as Sharon mentioned, the American with Disabilities Act, the ADA, the Rehabilitation Act, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which is GINA, and Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, as it is amended by the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. So for today's show, it's important to keep a couple things in mind. First off, many states have their own anti-discrimination laws. And where state and federal laws overlap or regulate on the same issue, such as discrimination, harassment, or retaliation, Employers are required to apply the law or the laws that are most protective of the employee. So in some instances, that may be federal law. In some instances, that may be state law. And most important, today, Sharon's going to be talking about federal law, the implications of uh, vaccine mandates and federal law. So with all of that in mind, let's get right into our first question, which is, Sharon, can my employer ask me about vaccinations? 
uh, my vaccination status? The answer in terms of the federal equal employment opportunity laws, the answer is yes. And again, that's all I can address from the EEOC. Uh, sort of following on what Teresa was saying is not just keeping in mind uh, state or even local laws that may address certain topics we'll discuss today, um, but also other federal laws. Again, EEOC only has jurisdiction for the employment discrimination laws. And under all of those laws, there is nothing that prohibits or prevents employers from asking their workers for their vaccination status. Doesn't require employers to do that, but nothing prevents employers from doing that. What is it about the, the question that implicates the law? Is it privacy? Is it? Actually, it's what sort of doesn't implicate our laws is that uh, for those of you who are familiar with the ADA, the American Disabilities Act, it does regulate the ability of employers to ask questions that might reveal whether or not someone has a disability. If I ask someone if they're vaccinated, whether they answer yes, no, I'm not going to answer, doesn't tell me anything as to whether or not they have a disability. That's why, I mean, the law that would be most implicated or most likely would have been the ADA, and it's not. So that's the reason that EEOC says for our laws, um, nothing stops an employer from asking that question. Same under California law. Um, that's the issue is, is an employer isn't allowed to know anything about an underlying disability that would give them that particular information. And again, under under California law, just asking that question doesn't violate anything, doesn't require an employee to elaborate about any underlying condition that they may have. So with that in mind, our next question, as an employer, can I make it mandatory that my employees be vaccinated? The question on every employer's mind right now. We know that because we hear from them <laughs> and from their employees. Um, and again, looking at it only from the perspective of the federal employment discrimination laws, nothing and any of the laws enforced by the EEOC prevent an employer from requiring that its workers be vaccinated. So again, from our perspective, if, if an employer chooses, so from our perspective, it's the choice of the employer. Um, nothing in our laws requires them to mandate vaccinations, but nothing in our laws prevent employers from mandating vaccinations. But again, paying attention to other federal laws, other state and local laws, because we're not the only game in town. Um, there may be others that have some say in this, but there are a couple of things to be aware of for those employers who do wanna mandate vaccinations or contemplating mandating vaccinations. Um, first caveat or first thing to be aware of, what if an employee's response to a requirement to be vaccinated is I can't because of a disability? Okay, that's raising the ADA right there. Uh, under the ADA, anytime the employer implements a qualification standard, and that's what a vaccine mandate would be, it becomes a new qualification standard. In order to work here, you must have the COVID-19 vaccination. Well, when somebody says in response to any kind of qualification standard, I can't do it because of a disability, then the employer has to look at that requirement as applied just to this one employee and be prepared under the ADA to justify it. What would happen if this unvaccinated person, because that's what they're saying, I can't be vaccinated, if this unvaccinated person were to come into my workplace? And what do we know about vaccines? They're intended to protect health and safety. And under the ADA, there is a standard called direct threat. That's what an employer would need to assess. If I allow an unvaccinated employee with a disability into my workplace, would that be posing significant risks either to the employee from being unvaccinated or 
to other people in the workplace. And the ADA lays out a number of considerations for employers to make that kind of assessment. It's all about this one employee. Employer can get information about the disability, why can't the person be vaccinated, about risks to the person, risks to other people, as I say, in the workplace. And always with the ADA, we end up with considerations around reasonable accommodation. If there really is going to be a significant risk uh, presented from the person having a disability, not being vaccinated, is there reasonable accommodation that would bring down or eliminate that high level of risk? And to take an easy uh, example of accommodation, one that will not work in all situations, but telework. You know, I, if I don't have the employee in the workplace, then they can't be posing risks to themselves or to other people. So certainly if the job lends itself to full-time telework, there's our solution as an accommodation. But if they have to come into the workplace, either sometime or all the time, are there accommodations to keep this person safe, to keep other people safe in the workplace? So you have to be prepared as an employer for request for accommodation around disability. If you're a worker with accommodation, you have a right to put your employer on notice and seek accommodation. Now, another group that might ask, or another person who might ask for accommodation, religious accommodation, not dealing with disability, but religion. And here again, employer has to think about that. In this instance, it's about a sincerely held religious belief practice or observance. Um, it can be somewhat idiosyncratic, by which I mean an employer can't say, well, show me in your religious tracts where it says you can't get a COVID-19 vaccination or any vaccination. It's, the emphasis is on a sincerely held belief, practice, or observant. That's why it's somewhat idiosyncratic. Employer can explore that a bit, but by and large, people will generally come in under that standard. But an employer does not have to provide an accommodation that uh, impacts or ends up having a more than minimal impact. Um, that's the threshold. Anything above a minimal impact on the employer, on its operations. So here again, that's that consideration. What would the health and safety risk be? Um, now, again, if someone can telework full time, we can solve that problem. But if you can't, again, anything above a minimal impact, employer would not have to do. What types of things can, because this always confuses employers. So employee comes and says, I have a religious, I need to be uh, accommodated religiously. We don't get vaccines, whatever it might be. And the employer is kind of stuck. They can ask, right? As you said, it can kind of follow up on that a little bit. But is there anything that an employer can ask for documentation wise, um, a letter from a, a rabbi, a, a priest, a whatever it may be, a, you know, some kind of documentation beyond just the employee's word. Yes, you can ask for documentation, but you have to be very careful because it comes back to that sincerely held. I mean, mm -hmm. um, religious authorities might say, well, there's nothing per se in the religion that says no, but that's not enough. Uh, to justify an employer turning the person down. That's why it really has to be careful. Now, the EEOC on its website, we have a huge document, what you should know about COVID-19. We go into these kinds of issues. We have a lot of information about this question, uh, about what kind of documentation should you be getting it, the caveats of about getting it, how much can you rely on it? And that's why what we emphasize is really the uh, strongest argument for an employer is more likely to be the impact, that it will be more than a minimal impact. So you kind of say, okay, we accept you have a sincerely held belief, practice, or observance, um, but here's what it's going to do us as the employer. Here's the impact of it. And that is probably, I won't say always the employer can show that, but that's the legally safer ground for an employer to explore. 
We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, more question and answers about vaccination mandates in the workplace. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The average time a resume spends on an HR manager's desk is seven seconds. And most of them are tossed aside. Now imagine if one of those resumes belonged to Yasmin, who was living in a shelter, juggling three jobs. I had to be resilient. That's something that you can't teach. Or if that resume was from someone who worked 12 hour shifts at the recycling company with my dad, who's 72. That taught me a work ethic that I carry with me every day. We rely so much on a resume, yet it could never tell the full story of someone growing up where I did. A lot of things could have gotten in the way of my goals, but I learned to push through and that's what I bring to work every day. So maybe it's time we look beyond the resume and look to grads of life. Discover new ways to develop great talent that are so much more than what's on paper at gradsoflife.org. A public service announcement brought to you by Grads of Life and the Ad Council. If you enjoyed today's show, do this. Share us. Like us. Give us a review on your favorite podcast app. It means a lot to us, and it ensures more people tune in and raise the bar at workplaces everywhere. Welcome back, everyone. We are talking with EEOC Senior Attorney Advisor Sharon Rennert about vaccination mandates. Our next question has to do with the federal government's uh, vaccine mandates. So if an employer is looking for guidance on putting together a vaccine mandate, um, can can they mirror what the federal government is doing? Nothing prevents an employer from the EEOC's perspective. Again, if you uh, choose as an employer to adopt the federal government's approach as an employer, then that will be consistent with the equal employment opportunity laws. Basically, for those who don't know, the way the federal government as an employer is approaching vaccinations is that it has every employee uh, fill out a questionnaire to get their vaccine data. But basically, you say you're either fully vaccinated uh, or you're partially vaccinated. So for uh, the Pfizer and Moderna, that you are supposed to have two shots if you've only had one, then you're partially vaccinated, that you are unvaccinated. And the fourth choice is I'm not going to reveal my vaccination status. Um, Based on those answers, if one is fully vaccinated, then the employee is not not subject to any regular COVID-19 testing. Uh, They're really not subject to any kind of safety protocols, except They have to wear a mask if where they work is in a place designated by the CDC as having high or substantial transmission rates. Um, I believe that's pretty much the entire country at the moment, but that can fluctuate. If you're in any of the other three categories, you are treated as unvaccinated, which means We don't care basically what the CDC uh, community transmission rates are. You have to be masked. You're going to be in the federal workplace. You have to wear a mask if you are unvaccinated or partially vaccinated or won't tell us. Um, You will be subject to regular COVID-19 testing either once or twice a week. Will depend on the agency how often. And there are some other restrictions that people will be subject to. So it's up to an employer, number one, if they want to do something like that, if they choose to do it, this is all consistent with federal equal employment opportunity laws, no problem, but do remember, be prepared still for requests for accommodation, whether related to disability or back or religion. And it won't be on the vaccination because it's, you have an alternative. You don't have to be vaccinated under this approach, but where might you get requests for accommodation? Someone saying, Maybe I can't wear a mask. Um, you know, that's where accommodation requests may come in. I can't be tested. Um, so you just need to be prepared and, and then handle them appropriately uh, under the federal equal employment opportunity law. I want to be clear, too, that there's a difference between requesting an accommodation and a refusal. So an employer can have 
an even stricter policy than what the federal government's doing. And you can do a, you know, get the shot, (laughs) keep your job. So, you know, some employers can take a hard line uh, if they choose to, to say you have to be vaccinated or you're going to lose your job. Now, the difference comes in, like Sharon had said, they'd still have to, in that circumstance, You may be able to enforce that, but you still have to take my and be mindful of requests for reasonable accommodation. Um, And that gets pretty tricky uh, when you're talking about terminating or thinking of terminating someone who's made a request for reasonable accommodation, whether it's a mask issue, whether it's a disability issue, whether it's a religious issue. um, You're still going to have to you're still going to have to take that into consideration. Right. There's no there's no getting around that at all that I know of. No, I mean, again, it, you have to engage the person on their request. Nobody's saying that you have to grant it or grant exactly what they're asking for, but the, you don't want to just dismiss it out of hand. That's a legally risky thing to do as an employer. Yeah, usually yeah. risky. <laughs> That's a big no-no. That's a big problem. All right. Well, I've heard a lot of, I don't know if you'd call it disincentive. So I know that employers are finding ways to, um, you know, encourage employees to get vaccinated. Um, I just recently read an article that said that Delta, as of, I think, in November 1st, they're raising the insurance rates of their employees by $200 or something like that, because they were saying it's costing them, a hospitalization is costing them $50,000 a uh an individual or something like that. So another reason to incentivize, I guess, getting, I don't know if you look at that as an incentive or a disincentive, I don't know. <laughs> but I, can you talk a little bit about that, of, about employers who are choosing to, you know, try to encourage their employees to get the vaccination so that we can sort of step away from some of these issues that we're having to worry about now? Well, again, For EEOC, it's two of our laws that may be implicated if employers are considering incentives. The ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, and GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Let's start with the ADA here. And again, remember, it is not just these laws that may be implicated. If we're talking about incentives, um, again, beyond any state laws that may be relevant, the Affordable Care Act. ERISA may come into play depending on how an employer wants to structure an incentive, HIPAA, wage and hour laws. So again, it's not just the EEOC's laws here. Employers need to think this through. Um, But basically, in terms of the ADA and incentives, what it's going to come down to is where would people, where would your workers be vaccinated? Is it the employer? that's going to provide the vaccinations or an agent that the employer hires to give the vaccinations on the employer's behalf? Or is it that the employer's saying, we're going to give an incentive, but employees, go find your own place to be vaccinated. That is the legally significant issue. And the reason is, for those who've been vaccinated, you know what happens. Before you get vaccinated, you have to answer a series of questions. Some of those questions could reveal whether or not a person has a disability. So if it's the employer or an agent on behalf of the employer who's going to be giving out the vaccinations, that means the employer is going to have access to the answers to those questions under the ADA. An employer may offer an incentive, but it cannot be so substantial as to be coercive. Now, of course, you're all immediately thinking, what does that mean? And unfortunately, I can't give you a more specific answer. So from an employer's perspective, this is kind of a legal gray area. What is, you know, is five or ten dollars so substantial is to coerce people to get the vaccines uh, given by the employer or its agent answer those pre-vaccine questions yeah five or ten dollars probably isn't but you know keep going up in terms of value at what point could it be would it be 
And so this is why it's a legally more uh, insecure route to take here. But what's the legally safe route to give an incentive? Where the employer says, employees, go somewhere on your own and just bring us back proof that you've been vaccinated. In that scenario, employer could have any value it wants, any value million dollars if you want. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it's structured as a kind of a benefit or a penalty. Either way, it, the value just doesn't matter here. So from an employer's perspective, it's far safer under our laws, EEO laws, to simply say, go find your own vaccination, go to your doctor, go to the local pharmacy, the local health department, whatever, but just bring us back proof that you've been vaccinated. Quickly under GINA, the only way this comes up, and GINA is about protecting people's genetic information, which includes the employee's family medical history. So an employer that says, not only do we want our workers vaccinated, but we want your family members vaccinated. And it's that same issue. If the employer's administering the vaccines or an agent on behalf of the employer's then the employer is getting to find out potentially that family medical history. When I have to fill out those pre-vaccine questions as the spouse, as a child, as a parent of an employee. And under Dina, employers can't give any incentive to get that information. So here, the only way to avoid Gina is once again, employer says, Go get your family members vaccinated by their doctors, by their local pharmacy, any place but the employer. Bring us the proof, and then here's the incentive we will give you in return. So once again, if the employer stays away from anything with the actual vaccination, then incentives are okay under Gina. It protects both employers and employees. You know, I think employees should be protective of their medical information when it comes to employment. Um, and I think that from a risk perspective, the less the employer knows, the better. Um, so I, I like those hands off, you know, just go someplace else and do it and bring us the the proof that you've had it done um, and leave it, kind of leave it at that. Um, I see we're getting that. I see we're getting that hatch for uh, the, the signal to wrap it up. But I, just as we wrap up today, can you give us your top three tips for either employees protection or employers or a cautionary tale, some words of wisdom for the future. What do you, what do you think? Um, I'm going to make it sort of four quick points. The first one, okay. anything about vaccination status is confidential medical information. And a lot of employees care about that. So that's important for uh, employers and employees to remember. You can ask as an employer for people's uh, vaccination status, but that becomes confidential medical information under the A. The EEOC has published a lot of information beyond vaccines related to our laws and COVID-19 issues. Go to the EEOC website, eeoc.gov. Um, You'll see right on our homepage a link to our COVID-19 publication. Lots of very helpful information here. Uh, for employers that may not yet know if it wants to mandate vaccines or provide incentives, or even if you do, one of the things that we point out in our COVID-19 publication is that employers can do a lot of things to help educate their workforce. No matter what else they may do, maybe they won't do anything else. But as we all know, there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of disinformation. So EEOC has provided sources of accurate information to get employers going. But beyond what we're providing on our website, employers could think of things closer to home in their own communities their own local health department, uh, state or local medical association who may be available even to talk to people, answer questions, you set up a kind of Q&A session, all kinds of ways of reaching people where they may be. And again, this could be the only thing an employer does, or it could accompany an incentive program. 
or a mandated program. And the final uh, piece of, of guidance I might offer is uh, for employers about being flexible. Um, absolutely, we all plan, it's important to plan, but if there's one thing we've learned over and over in this pandemic, circumstances change. And so that means our plans have to change. And so just you kind of have to build that in, is that we act on the best information we have today, but if something then changes, then again, we may tweak something, not throw it out and start from scratch, but just be aware that we have to respond to new information. This is an ever evolving situation. That's our show for today. Thank you so much for joining me and for sharing your thoughts and expertise with our listeners. You're welcome. Thank you. You can learn more about EEOC laws, as Sharon mentioned, that protect employees and guide employers by visiting eeoc.gov. You'll also find links to EEOC resources and some California resources on our new website at workplaceperspective.com. I want to also thank our listeners, my radio angels, James and the Nave at Night, and Workplace Perspectives team extraordinaire, our engineer and producer, Paul Roberts, our associate producer, Melissa DeLacy, with music provided by the very talented Stephen Versaloni. Thank you all for joining us on Workplace Perspective, and until next time, keep raising the bar. Keep raising the bar.